Hi and welcome back. This is episode four of a series that's all about Jesus, all about his heart and how he's changed my life and he can change yours. And today I want to share with you, um, based again on this book, Gentle and Lowly, about how Jesus is able to sympathise with us. He knows us and he has gone through anything that you're feeling, anything that you're experiencing, he understands. Now, I didn't always believe that. I, I was brought up in a Christian family. Uh, I, I knew the Bible. I had lots of understanding. I knew lots of knowledge. But I struggled to have an actual relationship with God. And I struggled to believe as I got into my 20s that he was, he was truly there, that he truly loved me and cared for me. In fact, the further I got into my 20s, the more disillusioned I got as life started to get a bit confusing or harder and having to make big decisions and responsibility. And in my late 20s, I eventually just fell away completely from church. In fact, I used to, I used to pride myself in saying God is like an absentee landlord. It's like he's, he's got the tenants in and then he's bogged off and he doesn't care anymore. And I actually used to swear at him through the ceiling, stick my fingers up at him through the ceiling and swear at him and just say, God, you don't seem to care. You don't seem to answer my prayers. My wife's suffering with these health conditions with long-term depression or um, now I've been made redundant and it's messy and I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on. And I sank into despair and anger and resentment. I felt like I was being left behind by my peers. I couldn't get a job. We had to move in with my parents-in-law and it was supposed to be a few months and it turned into a heck of a lot more than that. I felt so emasculated and I just abandoned God altogether because I felt that he'd abandoned me. And then I got to such a low point, such despair, and I'd been turning to drink and I I, I had my lovely wife and my children, but I just could not get us out of the situation. I had no hope for the future. And then God came crashing in at my lowest back in October 2013. And what did he say after I'd ignored him, after I had resented him, after I'd been so angry for so long? What did he say? He said this, I love you. <laughs> he said, I love you, Chris. <laughs> he'd been there all along. I hadn't felt it, I hadn't realised, but he'd been there all along. And I can look back now and see he was there all along. And this is what I want to share with you today. Dane Ortland in his book, like in the last episode, um, he, he bases a little bit on the writings of Thomas Goodwin uh, on his publication, The Heart of Christ. And what Goodwin's trying to do through that publication uh, he's trying to convince disheartened believers that even though Jesus is in heaven, he is just as compassionate, open and tender towards you, towards me, towards sinners and sufferers as he ever was here on earth. And um, find my Bible. If you have a Bible with you, turn to um, Hebrews, the letter to Hebrews in the New Testament. I love this letter. It's absolutely fantastic. It was my absolute pleasure to preach on it uh, a year, year and a half ago. Um, there's such truths in there. I remember saying he's the ultimate prophet, priest, king, PPK, and um, talking about trust and place of rest. And we're, we're seated and saved and sanctified. There's just, just so much amazing truth in there. And one of the amazing passages is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, since then we have a great high priest. Now what that means is, if you read the Old Testament, you see that um, before the cross, before Jesus, there was this whole system of, of trying to kind of get right with God, which was to offer animal sacrifices um, so that there was something that represented you and, and your sin. And um, the priests would administer all of that. And there was a high priest, and he was the only one who could go into God's presence in the temple, in a place called the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. And he could only go once a year into God's presence. But Jesus on the cross, he changed all of that. He became our high priest, the ultimate high priest, representing us to God and God to us. He was the last, the final sacrifice. And it says, since we have a great high priest, that Jesus, who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And what's the result of that? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What an amazing passage. We have a saviour, a high priest, Jesus, who is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. He's been tempted in every way. So this is all about Jesus' solidarity with his people, with us. And last time there was the example of the, the doctor who had the cure for the contagious disease and people rejecting it and him feeling that kind of frustration. But when someone came forward, he'd know this joy, someone has been saved and healed by this medicine. Well, now we go one step further. It's like this doctor, he's not just got the cure, but he's actually endured this very same disease himself. He knows what it's like. And in the book, uh, Dane Ortland's book in chapter four, he says this, it is in our weaknesses that Jesus sympathizes with us. And he talks about the word for sympathize is kind of made up of two words. It's, it means with and to suffer. So he says sympathize here is not cool and detached pity. It is a depth of felt solidarity, such as is echoed in our own lives most closely, closely as parents to children. Indeed, it's deeper than that. In our pain, Jesus is pain. In our suffering, he feels the suffering as his own, even though it isn't. His human nature engages our troubles comprehensively. His is a love that cannot be held back when he sees his people in pain. And then he also says, like, because I, I used to think, well, yeah, but where, where is he then? How does, how does he sympathise? Like, how, how does he know what I'm feeling like when I'm going through redundancy or emasculation, when I can't get a job and I can't provide for my family? Well, Ortland said, Jesus came as a normal man to normal men. He was always God, but he came as a man 2,000 years ago. He knows what it is to be thirsty, hungry, despised, rejected, scorned, shamed, embarrassed, abandoned, misunderstood, falsely accused, suffocated, tortured and killed. He knows what it is to be lonely. His friends abandoned him when he needed them most. Had he lived today, every last Twitter follower and Facebook friend would have unfriended him when he turned 33. He who will never unfriend us. He knows what it's like. And he endured all of that without sin. It says he was tempted in every way and yet didn't sin. And C.S. Lewis, the famous author who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he was a Christian and, and he, he gave the example of it's like a man walking against the wind. Have you ever done that? You're really walking against this powerful wind that wants to blow you backwards. And it's like that, that wind of temptation and it becomes so strong that the man eventually has to lie down and give in. But let me tell you this, Jesus never lay down against that wind. He continued. That man who lay down would never know what it was like to continue to endure for even longer. But Jesus never laid down. And therefore he knows the strength of temptation more than any, any of us. Only he truly knows the cost. So because of that, we do have a friend. He is with us. He does understand. He knows what it feels like to go what you are going through at the moment. And our tendency is to feel that the harder things get, the, the, the more um, alone we are. And uh, we sink further into, into pain and into isolation. But the Bible says we are never alone. And uh, Ortland says our pain never outstrips what he himself shares in. We are never alone. That sorrow that feels so isolating, so unique, was endured by him in the past and is now shouldered by him in the present. Isn't that amazing? And because he has no sin, he is the only one who can actually pull us up out of that pit. He's not trapped in the hole with us, but get this, he comes down into the hole to pull us back out again. That's what he did for me. When I was in that hole, he came in and he pulled me out, which meant he knew, he understood all along. And the, uh, the end of this chapter, Ortland says, if you are in Christ, 
you have a friend who, in your sorrow, will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too bound up with yours. Hallelujah, isn't that amazing? And if you don't know him, you can come to know him right now. Just ask for forgiveness for your sins and accept him into your life as your saviour and his heart will be bound up with yours. He truly understands you. He truly loves and knows you. He wants you to come to him. Thank you for listening.